I mean, you got to love the Bible, don't you? Two weeks ago, we had four skins. This week, you got people relieving themselves in caves. I mean, this is just not your average holy book, right? So before we dive into that, um, three announcements I want to make this morning. First of all, uh, this week uh, is Ash Wednesday. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. That's the beginning of Lent. And Lent may have all kinds of different connotations to you. I don't know what that conjures up in your mind, but Lent is a season in the life of the church that's historically given to reflection and introspection and repentance. It's the 40 days leading up to Easter, and so on Easter we celebrate with great joy the resurrection of Christ. And the 40 days leading up to that are a time for us to sort of take stock of our own souls and do the work of repentance. And so uh, the way we do that, one of the ways we do that every year at Quorum Deo is to have an Ash Wednesday prayer gathering. Uh, That's this coming Wednesday night, 7 to 8 p.m., not here, but at our old home down at Sukau Chapel on the campus of Grace University down on 10th Street. And so I want to invite you to come to that if you'd like to be a part of that. It's a real somber, simple uh, prayer service where we just sort of use liturgy and creeds and scripture to guide us in prayer and in repentance. And so that's this Wednesday night. And then in addition, on your way out, you can pick up this little devotional booklet called Journey to the Cross. Uh, This is from our good friends at Providence Church. Will Walker and Kendall Haug put this together. Uh, Actually sort of taken some stuff that they've been working on for years, even while they were serving here at Quorum Dale before we planted Providence Church. They were sort of pondering and writing some devotional material, and they've put that all together into a sort of a 40-day book of daily liturgy and devotionals that you can use during Lent. So you can grab this on your way out along with a copy of the annual report from last year, if you didn't get one of those last week. So grab that if you'd like to as we head into Lent. The second announcement, as I mentioned last week, is that we're going to do a large baptism on Easter Sunday. And so I'd love to know, if you're here, you're a new Christian, you want to get baptized in obedience to the Lord's command, um, the way Scripture and the way church history see it, baptism is really the initiation into the Christian faith. And so though you're saved by faith, not baptism, baptism is the sign and seal of that faith. And so it, it sort of signifies your death with Christ and your being raised to new life with Christ. And so what better day to celebrate that than on the day out of all the year when we most focus on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So, if you'd like to be baptized, I'll be out in the hallway after the service. Come find me. Let me know. I'll add your name to the list, aka the pad on my iPhone that I'm keeping the list on, and uh, pass it to our deacons, and we'll get you uh, headed toward that process. Even if you're not sure that you want to be baptized, but you just feel like, man, I need to start taking steps in that direction, let me know. Talk to me after the service. Uh, The final announcement I want to make uh, it's just a financial update since the month of January is behind us. And so as you can see on the slide behind me, we were about 20% behind giving-wise in the month of January. That's honestly not that big of a surprise. We've been doing this for eight years now. For some reason, January is always kind of a dip as people step into the new year and that kind of thing. And so not a big deal, but I do want you to be aware of it and want to call you to, once again, reevaluate uh, what's your giving look like. If you're a Christian Part of how you worship God is through giving. And if you're part of this church, this is part of being a part of the mission that we've adopted together of seeing renewal happen in our city and planting churches and multiplying missional communities. And so uh, that's where we were at the end of January. Uh, Please consider that. Prayerfully consider your part in what God wants you to do as we continue to live out the year. And we'll keep you updated after every month just so we can stay on track together with where we're going and how we're doing financially. So, having done those three announcements, then let's look at the book of 1 Samuel. Actually, 2 Timothy is where I want to start. Because in 2 Timothy, Paul tells us this. He warns us of people who hold to a form of godliness, but have denied its power. Isn't that interesting? I think we might say, and welcome to Omaha, Nebraska. Right? Right? A city where there's all kinds of people who hold to a form of godliness. We live in a religious part of the country. There are all kinds of people in our city who have some ritual observance. They go to church. They were raised in some sort of traditional religious experience. And so they have a form of godliness. And yet they have denied its power. There's no life in it. It doesn't transform them in any way. It is an external ritual or a worldview or a way of seeing things that doesn't translate into transformation. 
and change and worship. And we're saying we, we don't want to be those kinds of people. The Bible warns us against being people who have a form of godliness but have denied its power. That's not what we want to be. We want to be a people who know the power of the gospel, who know God in a life-changing way, not just in a cognitive and rational kind of way. And so we're in this series we're calling Knowing God, and we're taking a look at the life of David as sort of the textual basis for this series. So here's what we've seen so far. We've seen that knowing God begins with an experience of radical grace. We've seen that how we handle success is a great test or barometer of whether we know God. And then last week we looked at the fact that knowing God means seeking God in the everyday realities of life. It means having a conversational life of prayer and seeking after God. Here's what I want to add into the equation this week. Here's sort of the big idea that we see in 1 Samuel 24. Knowing God means obeying God. Knowing God means obeying God. Here's why we need to emphasize this. Here's why we need to talk about this and highlight this. Because for those of us who love the gospel, we know that we are saved by grace, not works. We are aware that the Bible says we're saved by the grace of God, not by our works. And so we want, to, we want to emphasize grace, and we want to lift up grace, and we want to highlight the grace of God in salvation. That's why we started this series where we did, that, that knowing God begins with an experience of radical grace. We want to start there. We want to lay that foundation. But what we can end up doing is unintentionally disconnecting obedience from grace. So that what we end up sort of communicating, whether we mean to or not, is you're saved by grace, and therefore it doesn't really matter whether you obey. It doesn't really matter whether you change. It doesn't really matter whether your life begins to come into conformity with the will of God. I don't think we mean to do that, but it's, it's a very easy mistake to make when we emphasize grace to disconnect obedience from Grace. That's why the Bible doesn't let us do that. Why the Bible continues to call us back to the linkage between being saved by grace and being changed by grace. That's why the Bible says, like in Ephesians 2, you're saved by grace through faith and you're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's why Martin Luther, the great reformer, said we're saved by faith alone, but the faith which saves is never alone. It always issues forth in obedience. Knowing God means obeying God. And we see a beautiful picture of this, a beautiful sort of um, vignette that raises this principle for us in this passage in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 24. We find in this passage that David is on the run from Saul, which again should be nothing new if you've been paying attention to the story. It's kind of the, the nature of 1 Samuel, David running for his life from Saul. And so he's hiding out in a cave, which again, not all that unusual for David. This is a different cave than the cave he was in last week. All right, so David and his guys are on the run. Saul and 3,000 of the Green Berets and the Airborne and the Special Forces are pursuing David and his men in this all-out manhunt. All right, so Saul's out to get David. He's in hot pursuit. He, he comes to this place called the Wild Goats Rocks. I don't know where that is, but it's obviously one of those places that if you were a Hebrew living at this time, you'd really be like, oh yeah, the Wild Goats Rocks. You know, it's kind of like down by Fremont. Okay, so they're out by the Wild Goats Rocks, and they're, David and his men are hiding in this cave. And in this strange twist of providence, Saul, in the midst of the manhunt, you know, nature calls. And so he kind of calls time out, like, hey guys, why don't you all hang here for a minute, you know, circle up, I need to go take care of some things. And so he goes into this cave to relieve himself. In doing this, he would not have been armed. He would have probably handed his armor and his sword to his armor bearer. So he's extremely vulnerable and he's not with his men, right? His men are over here. He's going into the cave to sort of be in privacy and be alone. And it just so happens that this is the very cave where David and his men are hiding. So David's guys are good God-fearing men. And they recognize, David, this isn't a coincidence, right? How, 
How strange is it? What a strange twist of providence that the very man who's out to kill us happens to be coming into the cave we're hiding in without his army and without his armor, and he's in the most vulnerable position anyone could possibly be in. Obviously, God's delivering him into your hands. Right? It's clear what we need to do here. Let's take his life. So the text tells us that David stealthily sneaks up and cuts away a corner of Saul's robe, which might seem odd as a military action, but it's actually not odd at all. Think about what's going on here. Saul's robe, Saul's garments that he would wear would have been sort of an expression of his kingship. They're they're a robe of authority. So think of it this way. The same way that Supreme Court justices wear robes, right? When you see them on TV, they're all dressed in robes, and, and those robes aren't like what they wear at home on Saturday afternoon, right? Those robes are a symbol of their office and of their authority and of the role they play in society. Bound up in that robe is a symbolic sort of office and title and significance. The same was true of Saul's garments. They they spoke of his role and his authority as king. And so as David cuts away a corner of this garment, he's symbolically cutting away, tearing away the kingship, the authority of Saul. The text doesn't explicitly tell us this, but I imagine this perhaps was just a precursor to more significant violent aggression that David and his men were prepared to take against Saul. But something interesting happens in verse 5. It says, after David's cut off the corner of Saul's robe, his heart struck him. It's a violent word in Hebrew. It speaks of accosting someone or surprising them or beating them. But what this is describing is sort of the visceral reaction that happens when your conscience provokes you. You know this feeling? That sort of knot in your gut that you get when your conscience kicks in and you realize, Matt, I've done something wrong. My daughter Sophie talks of it like the Holy Spirit punching her in the gut. That's what it feels like. But it's that, I mean, you can feel this physically. It's like that little knot that you get. There's a, there's a physical response to your conscience being provoked. Some of you haven't felt this in a really long time, have you? Because the Bible is clear that it's possible to defile the conscience. It's possible to dull the conscience. It's possible to subvert and to suppress and to hold down the conscience so that it no longer works as God designed it to. And if you're here this morning and, and that's you, you should be troubled by that. Because see, your conscience is part of the moral equipment God has given you to help you avoid evil and do what's right. Conscience is not a unique component of being a Christian. Conscience is something everyone has as a result of the fact that you're made in the image of God. The Bible says God has written his law on our hearts. That's the reality of conscience. You have a moral compass within you that has sort of, it's like a dashboard light. It goes off. It provokes you when you do what is evil and wrong. And yet for many of us, we've gotten used to ignoring and suppressing that, and so it doesn't work like it's supposed to. But see, if you'll just think for a minute, you'll remember and you'll recall times in your life when your conscience has worked like it's supposed to. You'll recall times when you felt what David felt, that that your heart was struck, your, your insides were pulled out, that knot began to well up in you to tell you, I've disobeyed God. I've done what's wrong and not what's right. Your conscience can't save you, but it's designed to point you in the right direction. It's designed to begin to help you walk toward truth and walk toward God and desire a life of virtue. David's conscience comes into play immediately as soon as he takes this action against Saul. And so it says that he immediately says to his men, "Not, I shouldn't do this. 
I can't do this. This man is the Lord's anointed. God has installed Saul into office. I don't have the right to take him out of his office. And so it says he, he persuaded his men and did not permit them to attack Saul. Right? You get the sense that they're kind of excited about attacking Saul and he's kind of having to go, oh, no, no, you know what, my bad. Let's not do that. And so in the rest of the chapter, you see this amazing interchange between Saul and David where Saul leaves the cave, David comes out after him, holds up the corner of the robe he's cut off and says, listen, Saul, can't you see I'm innocent? If I wanted to kill you, I just could have. I haven't sinned against you. I'm not out to take your life. I'm not a danger to you. Would you acknowledge before God and before me and before my men that I'm innocent? And Saul indeed does acknowledge that. In fact, he he has a moment of sort of emotion as he weeps and acknowledges, "You, you could have just killed me and you didn't. You're a better man than I am. And that lasts for, you know, a week or so until he goes back to his murderous, villainous sort of normalcy, as we'll see as we go on in 1 Samuel. I'm calling David's actions here radical obedience, and here's why. Because this obedience is costly to David. True obedience to God always costs you something. If David whacks Saul right now, all his problems are over, right? Right? He doesn't have to run for his life anymore. He's no longer a fugitive. He will be the next king because he's already been anointed by God as the successor to the throne. It's going to be great for him. His men will be able to have a normal life again. They'll no longer be on the run. All their bitterness and their debt and their distress that we looked at a few weeks ago, that all gets ironed out because now they're, you know, the right-hand men to the king. That's a little better place to be than the guys who are hiding in caves running for their lives. Right? There's a lot to commend the idea of taking Saul out. It would make David's life and the life of his men a whole lot easier. And so even his men are reasoning, hey, God's obviously in this. Can't you see the hand of providence in this situation, David? But see, God had said in Exodus 22, you shall not revile a ruler of your people. David is one who knows the law of God. He knows the commands of God. He knows that God has said, when I've installed a ruler, you don't revile, you don't lift your hand against that person. And so rather than doing what's easy, David chooses the hard road, the difficult road of obedience. Consider what this costs David. This means he's going to be on the run for another three, four years. Five years. He's going to continue to live as a fugitive. He's going to continue to hide out in caves and live off the land. His parents right now are living in Moab because it's not even safe for them to be in the country. His wife, Michal, whom he's married, the daughter of Saul, she lives in the capital city. He hasn't seen her. He's estranged from her because it's not safe for him to go there. His entire life is upside down. He's on the run as a fugitive, disconnected from his family, a man out of the norm, the mainstream, not welcome in the normal society of Israel. He chooses to obey God at great cost to himself. That's radical obedience. That's true obedience. It's easy to obey when there's benefit to you in doing so, right? More difficult to obey when it's great, there's great cost to you in doing so. David here has chosen the difficult road of obedience, not the easy road of obedience. So here's the question for us. Where can we find the power to obey God like this? Where can we find the power to radically, truly, passionately obey God? There have traditionally been two answers to that question. The first is what I might call moralism. The moralist answer to the question is, listen, if you struggle to obey God, if you struggle to live according to God's truth, the, the reason is probably because either you don't know enough or you're not trying hard enough. So the moralist says, here's what you need. You need more moral education. We need to help you understand more, know more about morality, about what God wants. 
And then maybe what you need is kind of a pep talk, some positive peer pressure, some community reinforcement. Okay, so let's put you in an accountability group, get you around some people that can reinforce what you should be doing. And now, go do the right thing. Right, now you know what you should do. Now we've reminded you that you should do it, so now go do it. What that approach tends to produce is Pharisees. People who know how to do the right thing externally, but inside their hearts may be full of cursing and bitterness and selfishness and self-love. They know how to externally do the right action whether or not it comes from the right heart. That's what moralism produces. People who keep the rules but never reflect on their heart and their disposition and their countenance in keeping the rules. There's another answer to the question of why we don't obey and how we can obey, and that's what we might call the relativist answer to the question, and it goes like this. Uh, your lack of obedience, if you struggle to obey God or to live well, you're, the reason is that you're trying too hard. Your conscience is probably weighed down with all kinds of rules and laws, and what you really need to do is let go and let God. Stop trying so hard. It's okay. Everybody fails. Everybody falls down. God loves you whether you obey or not. And there's truth in that, but it's not the fullness of truth. What does, what does this approach tend to produce? What this tends to produce is relativists, right? People who are not zealous about obedience. People who don't come alive with the desire to obey and follow and walk with and honor God. Psalm 119 was not written by a relativist, right? Oh God, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. I delight to do your commandments. That was not written by someone who doesn't desire and love to obey. And see, the weakness of both moralism and relativism is that they miss the heart of the problem. They, they flit around on the outside of things instead of getting down to the core of the problem. Why is it that we don't obey God? What's really at the heart of our lack of obedience? Do you know what it is? It's a lack of love. Jesus said, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So at the heart of our lack of obedience is a lack of love. We don't obey God fully because we don't love God fully. And see, moralism and relativism both bypass the heart. They don't solve the problem of our lack of love. They don't get down to the core of our motivations and our dispositions and our affections. So what can? What does? The gospel does. See, Scripture tells us we love because God first loved us. How do we remedy our lack of love? How do we become the kind of people who love God and therefore obey God? The answer is when we understand how God has first loved us. Seeing God's love for us as displayed and revealed in the gospel is what frees us and empowers us to love Him and therefore obey Him. The gospel is the good news that God so loved us and sent His Son. So let's talk about how God's love works. Let's, let's just reflect for a few minutes on the nature of God's love in the gospel. Because here's, here's the problem with how we often think, right? Everybody wants to say, because we know intuitively that it's true, God loves you. I mean, listen, the statement, God loves you, apart from any foundation, is a flimsy and flat and nebulous statement. 
Why does God love you? How does God love you? How is it possible for God to love you if God is holy and you're not? If God is perfect and you're not? If you've sinned against God, if you've disobeyed God, how can a good and holy and righteous God possibly love you? That's a question that has to get answered if we're going to understand how God loves us. See, God doesn't just love you. It cost him his son to love you. His love is not a nebulous, vague love. It is a costly, sacrificial love. God loves you because of the costly obedience of Jesus Christ in your place. Think back to the story of David. Think about David in the cave with his men. And here's what we begin to realize and acknowledge about David. His men are caught up in and implicated in his actions, right? If David whips out his sword and cuts off Saul's head, he's killed Saul, and by implication, his men are factored into that decision. In this case, his decision to obey God and to not kill Saul, his men are caught up in and implicated in that obedience, right? His obedience has implications. It gets transferred to them. They are swept up in and caught up in his obedience. And that's a great picture of exactly how the gospel works. See, the gospel is Jesus is our representative, and as his people, we are caught up in, we benefit from, we receive the advantages of his obedience. We have disobeyed God. We have been disobedient to God. Jesus was perfectly obedient to the will of God. Jesus obeyed God perfectly in our place when we didn't and when we couldn't. And see, when we are identified with Jesus through faith and baptism, we're caught up in, we're included in, we're factored into His obedience on our behalf. His obedience becomes yours. And here's what that means. God's love for him becomes yours. God doesn't love you in some vague and nebulous way. What happens is when you come into faith in Christ, the love that the Father has always had for his beloved, holy, sinless, perfect son, that love is what you get included into. It's an eternal, it's a weighty, it's a deep and significant kind of love. The father's love for the son is what you begin to benefit from and receive. God loves you because he loves his son. God favors you because he favors his son. You are caught up in and blessed in the love that the father has for the son. It's God's love for Jesus that you get. That kind of love is a transforming kind of love. Because see, that kind of love is not conditional. It's not based on what have you done for me today. Have you been an obedient Christian today? Have you done what I expected you to do today? It's not a conditional love that's dependent on your return of that love. It's an unconditional love because it's the Father's love for the Son, and it's the Son's obedience that you're caught up in and included in and counted into. And so that love doesn't change. It doesn't morph. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't get stronger and weaker. It's consistent and eternal and always present because it's the love of the Father for the Son. That's what it means when you are included into Christ by faith. That's what you get caught up in. That's what it means for God to love you. And see, when that love begins to get down into you, it changes you. It awakens in you a responsive love of sincere joyful obedience because that your love for God now isn't in isn't contingent right it's not like you're trying to manipulate God into liking you so you're obeying to get into his good graces it's God has loved me beyond what I deserve apart from what I deserve because he loves Christ and I'm in Christ and that's an amazing kind of love that changes me and transforms me and motivates me 
That's a love that makes me want to obey God because it's a love that gets down deep and awakens something in me. That's what fuels radical obedience. As those that have been changed by God's love, we zealously obey. We want to obey. We desire to obey. We desire to do what's right. Not because we keep God on the hook by doing so, but because Jesus hung on the cross so that we might do so. I want you to see how this plays out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I just want to put this verse up on the screen. I want to ask you to meditate on it with me for a moment. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. For the love of Christ controls us. It grips us. It governs us. It dominates us. It motivates us. So notice he says, the love of Christ gets a hold of us, it grips us, it it does something in us. And then notice this, because we have concluded this. Okay, so what what he's saying is, the love of Christ has gripped me and I've reflected on the nature of this love. I've reasoned through the implications of the gospel, and here's here's what I've come to see. Here's what we've concluded. Notice the rest of the verse, he's just working out implications of the gospel. That one died for all, therefore all have died. That's your death with Christ, right? This is what's symbolized in baptism. You died because Jesus died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You see what he's saying? Hey, just in thinking about the gospel, here's what I realized. Christ died for us so that we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised for our sake, on our behalf, in our place. So notice there's a control that the love of Christ exerts. There's an existential knowing of Christ's love, and there's also a reasoning on and reflecting on the nature of the gospel. The love of Christ compels us, it grips us, having concluded this. We've thought it out. We've reasoned on the implications of the gospel. If Christ died in our place, how would we not live for him? So where in your life right now are you struggling to obey? Let's be honest. Let's preach about obedience. All of us struggle to obey, right? All of you here this morning are struggling in some area. Obedience does not come naturally. It's not automatic. It's not easy. There's areas for all of us where we are struggling to walk in obedience to God. What is that for you this morning? And how do we live? How do we live in the good of the gospel in the midst of those struggles to obey? Here's what you should do. In the midst of your struggle to obey God. Number one, admit the weakness of your love. I just acknowledge, here's what's at the root of your struggle with obedience. You don't love God as you should. Now there, there's that great line in the hymn, prone to wander, Lord I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Right? My, my love is fickle. That's my problem. My, my, my love is not perfected. It's not what it should be. So the first thing I need to do is just admit, and God, the reason I have a hard time obeying is because my... My love is inconstant and incomplete as we professed in our confession of faith this morning. So first of all, admit the weakness of your love, but then secondly, consider and dwell on and rejoice in God's love for you in Christ. Admit your lack of love and then contemplate God's love for you. Go directly to the truth of the gospel and the depth and richness of his love for you. Third, Turn to him in humble, dependent trust. This is just acknowledging, God, if I'm going to obey, if I'm going to grow in my love, I need you. I need to depend on you. I need your Holy Spirit to change me and conform me to you and, and work in me so that my love deepens and so that my obedience grows. I need help. I can't do this on my own. There's a humble, dependent trust that the gospel calls us to. And then step four, lest we be relativists, all of us, zealously obey, right? Step four is now 
obey. Do what's right. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you and because you're able to, by the grace of God, through faith, as you rest in the good of the gospel. So this does not, notice though, this is step four. Right? The zealously obey comes after I admit my weakness. I consider God's goodness and grace to me. And I offer myself to him in dependent trust and ask for his help. What I'm really doing here is just helping us put some steps to what 2 Corinthians talks about. What does it mean to conclude? What does it mean to reason through the implications of the gospel in a way that actually changes us? See, the gospel is the only path to true obedience because it's the only thing that gets down to the heart. Moralism produces people who love rules, but not God. Relativism produces people who love not having rules, but not God. Only the gospel can produce a people who love God because only the gospel gets down to the root of the problem in our hearts. The real issue is I don't love God and I don't love his law as I ought to. I need a redeemer. I need to trust in the one who first loved me and gave himself for me. And when I do that, when I'm united with him, he begins to change me and transform me by his love so that I become the person who wants to obey, who loves to obey, who zealously longs to be more and more fully obedient to God because I love him and his love has changed me. He died for us that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us. Listen, here's what I can tell you. As we think about the calling and the mission God has given us in our city and in our culture, no one will come to Jesus through a bunch of moralists who love rules and don't have transformed hearts. And no one's going to come to Jesus through a bunch of relativists who are really great at living in grace and their lives never change. The only thing that's going to be compelling to a world that's watching and looking for something real and something authentic and something true is a bunch of people who are changed in what they love. And because they love different things, because they love a different person, they live in a different way. That's compelling. That's the kind of people God has called us to be, and that's the kind of people the gospel changes us to be. And so let's pray for the Holy Spirit to push that work forward this morning. Let's pray together. God, even as we see this morning this story of David, It sort of makes me laugh because we focus this morning on David's obedience and yet we know from the rest of the story that even David is not fully obedient. In fact, David's one of the greatest sinners in the Bible. He's a murderer and he's an adulterer and it's good for us that we're not saved by his example, but rather we're saved by the one that he points us to. And so thank you that you just didn't leave us giants of the faith to give us an example of a good life, but you gave us the Lord Jesus to live the life we could not live, to obey in our place, to die for our sins, and to be raised from death so that you might send your Holy Spirit to live in us and change us. God, would you this morning give us a vision and a longing to be people who zealously obey you? Pray for my friends here this morning who don't want to obey you because they don't yet love you. And I thank you that they're here and I pray that you begin to provoke and prick their conscience that it might begin to drive them toward you. And Father, for those here who have been changed by you and still we fail to fully obey you, I pray that you would continue to perfect and transform our obedience and our wills and our love so that we might become a people who are more and more obedient to you. And God, I pray that you do that by the grace of the gospel. I pray for those of us who have been raised in moralism that you would help us to stop living in that, to turn from that. So that when asked by people why we do what we do or why we don't do what we don't do, that our answer would not be, because that's how my mommy taught me to live. But our answer would be, that's what Jesus Christ has done in me. 
He gave himself for me. How could I not live for him? Would you this morning form us and transform us into a people who love you and obey you? And God, even as we come to the communion table, as we come to receive your broken body and shed blood, would you remind us of your perfect obedience for us? Would you give us great joy in resting in what you have done on our behalf so that we might rest in your love and walk out of here a people who love you more and are more committed to obeying you in every area of life? Change us first so that through your grace we might bring grace and the good news of the gospel to the city around us. We pray for your sake. Amen.